For you, the listeners of Freelancer Show, Loot Crate is offering an opportunity to save 10% on any new subscription at LootCrate.com. Just enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Loot Crate is one of my favorite things. Every month I get a box in the mail, costs less than $20, and it comes with all kinds of goodies. I have stuff from just looking at my shelf, Batman, Spider-Man, Ninja Turtles, Back to the Future, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and much, much more. So if you're a geek, a gamer, anything like that, and you want cool stuff to put around your office, cool t-shirts, comic books, etc., then definitely check out Loot Crate. To save 10% on your new subscription, go to LootCrate.com slash Ruby. Again, that's LootCrate.com slash Ruby to save 10% on any new subscription. Enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Freelancer Show. Today on our panel, we have Philip Morgan. Hello. And I'm Ruben Lerner. And this week, we are going to talk about designing a product ladder. So I guess let me, let me give a bit of background on this. Philip obviously chime in uh, when I neglect to mention things that are important. So it's a lot of freelancers have been moving over the last few years, are moving, want to move uh, into digital products, um, you know, ebooks and courses and all sorts of such things. Um, and it's pretty typical for people not to offer just one product, but to offer a different suite of products. So you might have a book and you might have a course, you might have coaching, uh, you might have you know, a few other things that are sort of along those lines. And the idea of a product ladder is you want to have sort of a, a clear or relatively clear path that someone will start off buying a really low cost product, sort of test the water, and they'll say, hey, this person's products are really great. I want to buy more. And the, the more then becomes not just more items, but more items at greater cost and obviously greater value, or we would hope greater value. So that over time, they are sort of more and more inclined to buy your things and also get more and more value out of it. Um, and then you can have sort of a whole suite of things that they sort of end up moving through. You can imagine this whole funnel that they start with something small, end up with something big. Um, and by the time they've gotten through all of your products, they've gotten tons of value and you have presumably then made hopefully tons of money. Philip, did I sort of describe that roughly well? I think so. I think, be, you know, becoming very pedantic for a moment, we could say it's not just products. I think the same thing we're talking about applies to services or a blend of products and services. So okay. just with that one modification, just to, I think we kind of are kind of saying we're, we're probably will use the word products for this podcast, but really I think the concepts are applicable also to services. Like you might have a, an inexpensive service that someone is like the starting point for you or, or for a new client, they might buy that inexpensive service. And then from there, progressively spend more and more money. Um, and I guess uh, the other thing is we may talk about this very strictly as, or we may kind of give the impression that people are going to start with your cheapest thing, whatever that is, product or service, and go up the quote unquote ladder from there. But that it's not always how it happens in practice. So um, don't get the idea that this is some sort of you know, theoretical ideal that only works one way in reality. And <laughs> reality is always more messy than theory. Huh. huh. That actually, I hadn't thought of that. I sort of figured that the, the goal was actually to start people on smaller ones, but I guess it doesn't have to be, or you, you shouldn't like shoo people away. Although I know when I was in Stockholm uh, a few months ago at a Brennan's conference, the W freelancing conference for Europe, uh, we had, okay, now I'm like his name, uh, Sean D'Souza, uh -huh. right? Of, um, and he was talking about product ladders. And he said you sort of want people to go from something small to something bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you sort of lead them down as well. And he said for his products, he actually refuses to sell to people unless they've gotten the cheaper first products. But that might just be an extreme example of someone who's successful despite um, shooing people away. You know, I'm working with a guy now. He's He's just one of my favorite clients. And the way that he became a client was he heard me on a podcast, not this one, a different one, and um, got in touch and immediately we started working together at the highest level of intensity that I have, which is my one-on-one -on -one retainer, uh, which also costs the most. 
So that's an example, uh, and that's not the only one um, where I could have said, okay, you need to re- you know, read this book first. Here's where you go to buy it, or I'll send you a copy, or I'll give you a discount on this book. And if you like what you see there, then we can go from there. But um, that also might have been enough of a, a sort of speed bump or roadblock for him in terms of the timing. Like he was ready for the kind of help that I offer at that highest price thing. Like, you know, yesterday he was ready for that kind of Mm -hmm. help right away. And so in that situation, um, for me to say, well, you just, you can't do that would have been, I don't think that would have served him as well as just saying, okay, let's talk about what you actually need. And there's, you know, let's give you that thing give you access to buy that thing. I understand where Sean D'Souza is coming from, though. A lot of his higher price stuff are things like workshops. And you need to come into those workshops with the right uh, sort of mental prerequisites. And those come from reading his book, The Brain Audit. So okay. I think in that, in that case, it's almost more like saying, well, this, this thing, this workshop is like the 300 level class to use that sort of university um, system for, you know, categorizing classes based on difficulties. And you need to take the 101 and the 201 level first. And those come from a book or something. So it makes a lot of sense, but I think there's that additional context of, you know, the reason he has people walk up that product ladder is because the more advanced stuff needs that prerequisite skill and mindset to be in place first. Got it. Got it. Okay. But I want to ask you a question. I want, I want to circle back to eventually to <laughs> your specific product ladder and talking that through and seeing if we come up with any new ideas. But uh, this also, I, I'm stealing this directly from Sean D'Souza. Uh, do you own any Apple products, Ruben? Yes. Yes, I have a uh, Mac. I don't actually have an iPhone. Um, I, have, I have an Android phone, whereas my wife, by the way, has a Windows PC and an iPhone. So we're a perfect odd couple there. <laughs> you, you're like a mirror image of each other. <laughs> yeah. So um, what was the first Apple hardware or software product that you started using? Ooh, it was probably uh, a Mac back in the late 80s, early 90s. Okay, l- let's, okay, after that, like post, Post, uh, you know, Steve Jobs reboot of Apple as a company, what was? Well, <laughs> I actually have a next machine. Oh, um, wow. Those are so cool, <laughs> man. I, there was one in college in the computer lab, and I just marveled at how beautiful it was. I didn't know how to oh, use it, but I always loved that. It was amazing. It was amazing. And, um, and so when I got to grad school, um, my advisor had a budget for us to get computers. Uh-huh. And um, I had used Linux on my laptop for like 10 years, maybe a little less. And I was getting a little tired of the annoyances there. And I said, well, I'll just, I'll just get a Mac because it's basically a I – know, I knew the next machine. I knew what the software was like. Apple was actually at that point a viable company that had made it even better. So I said, well, I can get all the Unixy stuff I want and all the next stuff that I liked on a, on a computer that lots of people are using. So I guess it's been since 2003. I've That was my first like – you know, get, getting an Apple product as my main uh, main computer. So I went a different route that's pretty cleanly illustrates the the product ladder progression with Apple. So the first Apple thing I ever installed, because I was like a Windows PC guy because I, I was doing Windows system administration back in the 90s. So the first Apple thing of any kind I ever installed was iTunes to organize oh. mp3s right and then from there the next thing you want to guess what so they're probably an ipod yep i bought an ipod and the next thing was an iphone the next thing was a used macbook pro and the next thing was a new mac mini so th- that's almost like a perfect <laughs> stepping up the ladder in terms of price um, yes 
And, and I should mention also, I, I read this book uh, recently about the development of the iPhone, and they mentioned there how some of the people went to Steve Jobs and said, listen, you've got to allow us to have iTunes on Windows. And at first, Jobs said, no way, no how. It's only a Mac thing. And they said, basically, you idiot, <laughs> this is going to bring <laughs> people in to buy our products. And he finally relented, and you're a perfect case study of, uh, of what they were aiming for and how they were right. That's exactly how it worked because I didn't say it explicitly, but of course, the iTunes went on a Windows PC in my case because I was uh, like a Windows guy at that time. So, uh, Sean D'Souza uses that example as uh, you sort of, you sell people the thing that they're ready to buy and it's probably a low price point because they don't trust you very much. They don't know, really know who you are. And that was exactly my situation with Apple. I didn't pay anything for iTunes because it's free, but... It was a sort of Trojan horse <laughs> where they got into my mind and my world and my daily experience in a, I mean, now, I mean, there's just, iTunes has got to be one of the most criticized pieces of software in the history of the world, except for Windows itself. <laughs> <laughs> but um, at the time it was like, oh my gosh, this, you know, this is a sort of uh, wonderful piece of software that solves a problem for me. So it was a sort of Trojan horse for Apple to get in and start delivering some value and changing what for me was a, either a neutral or negative perception of Apple as a company. I was like, oh, they just make toy computers for, uh, you know, <laughs> designers and, and higher education. That was the perception I brought to it because of, you know, the biases of being in the Windows world. Very interesting. So it was a product and you didn't even have to pay for this thing, but it sort of sucked you in. And you said, well, now I trust them. So now maybe I'll get something a little bigger or that costs money or costs a little more money. Yep. Um, and so it's always a matter of building trust through adding value. You know, I think that's one of the functions of a product ladder. Again, I, I said there have been a few cases with me where someone started working with me from kind of not uh, like they, it wasn't like they bumped into me on the street and they're like, well, you seem like a nice guy. Can I hire you at your most expensive price point? There was <laughs> something like uh, hearing me guest on a podcast or something like that, that, that created that, that initial little, uh, deposit of trust in their mind and gave them the idea that I could help. So it, again, it's not like completely like they just stumbled across my picture on Facebook and sent me money, but, um, yeah, there've been a few cases where someone bought at the highest level, but generally in my experience, it's the vast majority is this other way that we're talking about where there's something free, the free thing builds trust. It demonstrates that I'm a, you know, what I have to offer is relevant to what they need and then they dip a little toe in the water of, you know, the world of things you could spend money on that I offer. And they bought a book or something like that. Mm -hmm. So this is, I think, a powerful idea that we're, we're talking about because of how it gives people choices. Uh, I mean, maybe that's really what we're saying here is when you've got multiple options and, and, there's, you offer something that starts at a price less than $10,000 worth of your services that can be very powerful. So I, let me, let's put the focus of the spotlight back on what you're doing, um, for a moment. Ruben, what's your uh, quote unquote product ladder look like? So, um, let's ignore the stuff I do for trainers okay. and let's ignore the stuff I do for corporations. Okay. Like the main set of products that I'm sort of working on, trying to improve, um, trying to really sell, um, are things for programmers and most specifically Python programmers. So I have two eBooks, uh, one about what, one, one, uh, which is a book of 50, uh, exercises in Python. So it's not meant for people who are new to the language. It's meant for the people who have taken a class in the language and want to improve their fluency. Um, and the same thing is true with my book on regular expressions. There I give a very short tutorial, but that's 50 exercises to sort of improve your fluency there, which is not necessarily specifically Python, but I, I think most of the people buying it are Python people. So those are like, I could you would say either the entry point or middle point purchases, depending on whether you book alone or the book plus videos. Each of the books has 50 videos, one for each uh, exercise, where I do a screencast showing how to solve it. Mm -hmm. Sounds like my, my intro level. 
The next level I have, um, well, I, I've been doing some live courses. You know, I discussed before the recording, that's probably going to be changing where I'm going to do some recorded courses. But I've done some live courses, which and those were more expensive for sure. Um, and um, that I saw as sort of a step up for people. Uh, I also am selling recordings of those live courses at a bit of a discount because there's no interactions. And you get to sit around while people do their exercises, which is a little funny looking, I admit. <laughs> um, and so I see doing more recorded courses, sort of like the higher end, high, high or highest end of my ladder. Okay. And in, betw- in between, then I have this thing called a weekly Python exercise, which is a monthly subscription, which I guess if you were to subscribe to it at infinitum, then I would be delighted. But it means that it's per month a relatively low outlay. I think mm-hmm. I, I charge $15 a month, one five. And $150 a year. So you get like you know, two months free, basically. Okay. Um, so I think I see my ladder as people buying the books, then people buying weekly Python exercise, then people doing the courses with me. But I think there's some it's, – it's not a, a very clear distinction there. And I think there are people coming in at all levels. And I also think that I'm not doing a very good job of pushing people from one to the next. In fact, I'm not. Right. There's some interesting stuff in there that I, I, I'm not sure how, it, like, what kind of meaning that word pushing is loaded with, <laughs> like a drug. Encouraging. I, Remember so, when so, drug so dealers know, used to be called drug pushers? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, for example, I, you might do this also, but I know that Jonathan, um, in his email list, the footer basically tells you about the next higher up product that you have not bought from him. Right. So if you haven't bought anything, he tells you about the book. If you bought the book, he tells you about his group coaching. If you bought the book coaching, he tells about the one-on-one coaching. Um, so I've thought about doing something like that. I just haven't gotten sophisticated enough with it so far. Um, but it's also not 100% clear to me how to do that sort of pushing because I have my weekly messages. I have a, about a 6,000-person mailing list. I, I email on a basically weekly basis. Um, and that's the cornerstone of where I, that what I want to be using to be marketing to people. Sure. Like you're getting a message from me. The message gives you value. I've even gotten complaints that the messages are too long and detailed. Um, really? so like, I know how, I dare you. Talk. how dare you? How dare you I deliver just, so much value? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just cut out every other word randomly. Um, so who needs verbs anyway? So, so I, I've, I've been thinking about using that to do that same sort of thing and say, well, if they haven't yet bought my book, I'll tell them to buy the book. If they haven't bought, if they haven't bought the book, but I'm not sure sort of what to start out with. It's not obvi- It's not 100 percent obvious to me which is the best place to start and what I should see as going up on the ladder as opposed to just sort of horizontally. Yeah, and I was thinking of interrogating you a little more about sort of the journey. Is there some sort of somewhat deterministic like beginner to expert journey where you're trying to map your products to that or maybe is the progression from from one place to another uh look different than like progressively increasing expertise so uh, with a survey that I did of my list mm-hmm. just a few days ago asking people what they want to learn. Um, So one of the questions I asked was, how long have you been programming? And I have a beautiful, um, what is it called? I don't want to say bicameral. Bicameral is the wrong word. Like I have a two hump. uh, um, Sort of a bell curve with two humps. (laughs) Yeah, bell curve with two humps. So I have about 30 to 35% of the people on my list have been programming (laughs) one year or less. Uh And about 35% have been programming five years or more. Um, so I, I have two different audiences I'm dealing with and the, and then I also ask them what courses they're interested in having me teach. And for the most part, people were interested in more advanced subjects. So, but there was also not a small number of people who wanted like how to think like a programmer and intro to Python for people new to the language. Okay. So I think that once I fill out those courses and we're talking like a year or two from now, at least because it's a lot of courses, a lot of video, but then I'll have a clear beginner to expert progression and I'll be able to say to people, okay, you want to start here and then move on to there and then move on to there. Like that, that I think will be pretty clear. It's less clear to me now with the products that I have, um, where people should start 
other than price and commitment. Right, right, right. So, th- I mean, that may be one axis of increasing commitment is I'm going to help you increase your expertise or your, your skill or something like there's kind of, that might be one way to look at it is simply here's how you get better is you, you get the next thing. I can see product, I can imagine or think of product ladders that don't quite work that way where increasing expertise is not the thing that people are trying, they're not trying to ascend some ladder of expertise. They are, it's different. Like think about, uh, like I don't really go to live music very much um, just because I kind of hate crowds and hate standing up for that long and, (laughs) you know, a variety of like old fuddy duddy kind of reasons. Um, but I, I know that when you attend live, like when you buy a ticket to a live show, there's different price tiers, right? Some of that is just based on your physical proximity to the stage. You know, like there's seats that are considered better because they're closer to the stage, even though those seats may not, in fact, be objectively better, but they're more desirable because they're closer. And then you can right. maybe, in some cases, pay a lot extra and get the backstage pass and get to meet the uh, performer or the artist or whatever. Right. And um, and then there's probably even more exotic uh, price tiers that, you know, you get to spend a half day hanging out with the artist or something like that. And it and, and the differentiation between those that product ladder is not really about expertise or you're a newbie or whatever. It's sort of your level of enthusiasm for the thing and, and how mm-hmm. much you're willing to spend to get that kind of experience. And I'm not sure this is quite relevant to your product ladder, Ruben, but just to kind of broaden the conversation so it might include other situations for the folks at home who are listening to this, I think that's another way to do it. Like I was at a conference this past weekend and there were two price tiers. Uh, One was a ticket to the conference and the other was a VIP ticket that included lunch where for the standard ticket, you know, lunch was not included. And it included like some, some sort of extra access to the, the talent (laughs) that was speaking at the conference. So you got to have lunch with the speakers and they had a sort of ask me anything session. That's a Mm -hmm. similar, I think a similar example of a product ladder. Um, Right. And indeed, um, like some, when I was talking to people on the Slack channel, I forget which one, a few days ago about this whole result that I got from my survey, I expressed disappointment that people don't want live class. I mean, I understand. Truth be told, once I thought about it, it made sense to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I expressed disappointment because I said, I really like doing the live classes and I think they're good for people also. And they said, well, people might see that as a high value add-on. So maybe you could sell the recorded classes and say the first 10 people get you know an in-person webinar. And that's selling the same sort of access either as an incentive, you know, to, as a motivator for people to buy or even at a higher price point. Right. And, and I suppose that example that I just gave and, and what you just mentioned is not so much a product ladder per se. It's just like different ways, ways to structure a price tier for a single product. Mm-hmm. So anyway, it sounds like in your case, the journey people are on is increasing expertise, right? Increasing skill, increasing expertise. Like that's why they might go further down this journey with you beyond that entry level product. Right. Right. The basic idea is, you know, you are using Python and you want to get better at the way I express it always is you want to get more fluent with it. Um, so that you're not constantly going to stack overflow, which I, um, sort of describe as a, a, like a phrase book in a foreign language that you can sort of get by with a phrase book, but it's not going to give you the depth of conversation or the insights that you would have through true fluency. And so the idea is people by taking my courses and using my services and buying my books will through this variety of media and content improve their fluency and thus become more valuable both in their own careers and to their current company. So is there a well-defined, I mean, a reasonably well-defined sort of framework that maps out how you get better? Like, is it kind of commonly understood in the world of Python that, okay, the starting point is 
sort of understanding procedural level programming in Python, and then you move to object oriented or something like that. Vaguely, yes, but I don't think it's different in Python than other languages. I mean, there's certain Python specific things that when you get more advanced, that you're sort of expected to know, and people ask me about. Yeah. So, uh, so I would say they're clearly topics that are advanced, mm-hmm. and they're clearly topics that are basic. And I guess just sort of by default, the rest of the topics are sort of intermediate. Okay, so there um, might be sort of three, three layers of of the cake here, or three yeah. three steps up the ladder, basically. Right. But again, I guess my products so far haven't really looked at those. Maybe I should. I mean, this this is why this conversation is so valuable to me, um, I mean, among others. But it maybe I need to think about it in terms of um, increasing expertise, right? Where, and again, I can, think, I can imagine a year or two from now having a whole bunch of video courses saying, okay, these are for your first six months in Python. These are for your, you know, your second set of six months, you know, your second year. Um, as you sort of grow in fluency and understanding. Um, to use the analogy you used earlier, like, you know, these are the 100-level courses, the 200-level courses, and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying for sure that's the reason why people walk up the ladder with you, but that I, I feel like it's important to to clarify and understand in any product ladder, why would someone go to that next step? And I, f- I feel like your prospective customers need to really get it. You know, in, in the conventional higher education university system, why would you take a 300-level class after you've taken a 200-level class? Well, you can't get your degree without it, right? <laughs> like, that's a pretty clear reason why. It's like <laughs> you are going to progress through this kind of predefined progression that we have for you. And if you get to the end, you get the degree, you get the piece of paper. And if you don't, you have given us money, you have maybe gotten an experience that was valuable, but you don't get the paper (laughs) unless you meet this set of requirements. You don't have, you don't have that kind of carrot slash stick combination in, in your situation. So I do think there needs to be a clear reason why someone would continue down this road with you past the beginning level. Right. So I, and I even got that question to some degree, I couched it a different way. So when I announced weekly Python exercise, someone who had bought my books asked me, emailed me and said, well, are these going to be different exercises than the books? Uh-huh. Because they were sort of concerned. I was just repackaging existing material. And I said, no, no, this is all new. And the idea is then people should be able to get these different products and not feel like they're just recycling the same information. Right. But maybe I need to Maybe I need to describe it that way, like email the people who bought the book and say, if you like the book, you're going to love Weekly Python Exercise because it's more of the same style. But and I guess actually it is more advanced topics, right? I guess now that I think about it, I have been pushing people harder on advanced things that I did not do in the books. Um, And the fact that there's like a community and um, sort of a, a sense of suspense that you have to wait a few days to get the answer. So, yeah, I guess it is more advanced in that sense. And dragged out over more time as well. Like the book, you can either read it or not, and you can take as long or as little as you want. And we think Python exercise by design is um, dripped out over time, in part because I think that helps with the learning. Right. I think we're getting into maybe a second axis of differentiation, which might be mo- less about the, the, the expertise or the level of difficulty and maybe more about learning style. You know, like with books, mm. or learning style is a little too specific. That's not quite what I mean. It's more about like delivery format and what's a good fit for you in terms of your, again, I don't want to say learning style, like maybe just how you motivate yourself to grow or develop new expertise. So with a book, you know, you're on your own. You got the book, you're in your mind palace, you've got to carve out time to read it. Uh, if you're not just naturally reading all the time or you've got to decide what not to read so you can spend time on this, you know, like it has a sort a sort of a certain dynamic of how it works when someone buys a book and how that contributes to their learning and something like that's showing up in their inbox that's inviting them to do a challenge with, I mean, what support do they have to do that challenge? Do you run your own freelance business or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side? Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way 
to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. So there's a forum and other people who are well, mm-hmm. so the form, uh, and, and, and I, I've got to actually rejigger the product a little bit. I'm planning to do that in the next month or two. Mm-hmm. But in, in theory, you can be on a forum with everyone else who's doing that same exercise. The problem is that there's a limited number of people doing that same exercise in the same week. So right. I sort of originally thought, oh, well, they'll all help each other. But I'm now realizing, well, I'm not sure how many people are really in the same place at the same time. But sure. In theory, it's there. Right. There's this different uh, configuration of the support. And like the task is different with the, with the book. It's like, let me understand what the author is saying. Let me try to retain it, but applying it, you're on your own buddy. Right. Whereas with these exercises, they're all about the application and you know, how you do it is like, well, you might go reference this book or you might go look at stack overflow or you're kind of on your own. You're, you're, you know, thrust on your own devices to, to complete these challenges is how I, so it looks really different, but maybe the difference is how, you know, how it challenges you. It's like, if you're trying to, I guess, uh, get better at some sort of athletics, you can be in the gym, like lifting weights, or you can be doing the thing, you know, the sport that you're doing both might help, but they look really different in terms of how they challenge someone to get better. So the difference between um, the weekly challenges product you have and the books you have may not be so much the level of expertise. They could be trying to build the same level of expertise, but doing it in very different ways. Mm-hmm. One is challenging you to learn new concepts and, and recall those. And then the other is challenging you to, you to apply those concepts. So, in- And actually with the weekly exercise, it's not even applying new uh-huh. Applying the concepts, it's also I'm pushing people to learn new things. Like I say, for this exercise, you're going to need to look up X and Y and Z, um, which I definitely don't do with a book. I, mean, I really thought about that, but yeah. So I'm not really trying to overcomplicate your product ladder here, but what if it looked like this, where there's a clear progression in expertise? So there's a book that's like a basics book, and then there's a companion thing which could be bought separately or in conjunction with the book which is weekly application exercises at a basic level. Now, once you feel like you've mastered that, you can then move on to the next level up the expertise ladder, which also has two products, a more advanced book, and then a companion product of, you know, application exercises. Mm -hmm. In that case, I think it's clarified because you can say to people, okay, how do you learn best? Do you learn best by reading and then just doing whatever you you want to do? Or do you learn best by reading and then having some, you know, very well thought out challenges that would help you apply what you've just read about? I I don't know. Maybe that clarifies things or maybe it muddies the waters, but something to think about, I think. It it points to some holes of the product ladder because it is true that it's not obvious what level this is aimed at. Right. So the book is aimed at people, as I said, like I've sort of been through an intro Python course and want to push themselves to to understand how to apply that. Mm -hmm. Whereas the weekly Python exercise is more people who want to stretch and extend themselves. And it might mean then that there's sort of a, a missing piece there, which is a weekly exercise for people at that basic level, either because they just want more of the same or because, um, they, they learn better in that different style. Right. right. I, I, I have thought on occasion about having sort of different levels, different uh, um, sort of 
style, not styles, but yeah, different levels of the weekly Python exercise. Like, do you want to be in the beginner track or the intermediate track? Yep. Um, I mean, I've got more questions than answers here, but I think, I, I do think it needs to be kind of like, what would a fifth grader understand in terms of what's the difference between this and that? I, I feel like that sort of very simple level of distinguishing between your products is is desirable because I think it just makes a purchase decision easier. The reason this is so much on my mind is because, you know, with my sort of hybrid product services ladder, I run into a similar problem of like, how do I distinguish these things? I'll run down the list. Uh, in case it's interesting to the folks at home. So I've got two books now. One is called Specializing Without Failure. That's just a simple $29 book that quite often I give away for lead generation purposes. And then I have the Positioning Manual for Technical Firms, which is kind of my main book. It's got two, uh, actually three price tiers. But it's, you know, it's like a single product. And that's, I think, where most people kind of get started with the stuff that I'm trying to help them with. And then from there, I have something called the uh, Positioning Accelerator Program. That's a $450 a month uh, subscription that gets you access to weekly office hours calls and a Slack channel and me really trying to personally help wh whoever's in that program with this process of moving out of a generalist market position into some kind of specialized thing. And then I have a one-on-one -on -one retainer, which is $2,400 a month. And that's basically my product services ladder. So in my case, the differentiation, and I'm not saying I've done a perfect job of this by any means, but I really did kind of wrestle with like, what's the, why, why should people choose one over the other? Oh, sorry, I missed something. I have a course that is not selling at all <laughs> that I need to really revamp called the uh, positioning course. And that's currently at this uh, $399, $399 price point. I think it's overpriced and I'm going to fix that. But um, I think that's part of why it's not selling. But that's kind of in there also in the mix. And so what I arrived at was, it, you know, the main axis of differentiation between all of those is how much help do you need? Do you want to DIY this sucker? Get the book. Do you want you know, a sort of a minimum level of, of somewhat customized support, get the group thing, the accelerator program. Mm -hmm. Do you need lots of one-on-one -on -one help? Get the one-on-one -on -one thing. So that was me trying to make it obvious why you would choose one over the other. But it's still not quite the same kind of product ladder that we've been talking about where someone might ascend the product ladder by buying every, basically every product, on the ladder. It's still not quite like that. And I'm, A, I'm not sure that that's some theoretical ideal anyway that we should be striving towards. And B, it's, um, I don't know that, you know, that really lends itself to that many businesses anyway. But that's, I mean, that's currently how mine works. Well, I'm going to guess that most of the people who end up doing your coaching first bought your book. It's not the examples you gave earlier, but I'm going to guess like the, the largest number, either the group coaching or the one-on-one. -on -one. So that's, a to me, a super interesting question. Yes is, is like the immediate, uh, yes, for sure. Mo that's actually what happens. Most people who spend more than the price of a book, meaning they buy, you know, the, the, week, you know, the, the, the positioning accelerator program or the one-on-one, -on -one, most of them have read my book. But not always. Um, and I had a guy a while back, about, about a year back, in a workshop that I did, which is more expensive than the, the 49 or the $99 book package. He said, when I asked why he took the workshop in a survey after the fact, he said, well, I wanted to read your book, but I figured if I took this workshop, you'd just give me the bullet points of the book <laughs> without <laughs> me having to read it. And I <laughs> laughed because uh, like this, I love this guy. He's great. Um, and he, he kind of tells it like it is. So he was just like, well, this might be a more effective use of my time. I might get more value than the book also, but at least I'll get the bullet points of the book. So he was willing to spend three times the price of the book, three or four times the price of the book, I think, for to get the the book not read to him like 
an audio, you know, an audio book, but still kind of get the essence of the book conveyed to him through a different type of format, a more expensive format. And that was just one, one data point, but I said, maybe there's more people like this guy out there. So back to something you said earlier, Reuven, you were talking about in using your email marketing software to display a call to action to buy the next thing on your product ladder, the next more expensive thing or the next thing up. And yes. I used to do that. So I would only pitch the positioning accelerator program to people who had bought my book using, you know, drips, uh, conditional, um, content in an email. And I think that's fine. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but I stopped doing it for that reason because I had at least one data point that said, well, there are people who will buy a more expensive thing and they'll kind of skip that entry level rung on the product ladder for what for them are really good reasons. So I kind of loosened up, you know, I, I did really buy into that Sean D'Souza, that rigid idea that, you know, um, you shouldn't uh, let people skip that kind of indoctrination phase. <laughs> um, but I, I've loosened up a bit on that. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I currently just randomly, I, I, I have a, like a randomized thing at the bottom of my newsletter and it either shows them a uh, call to action to buy my Python book or my regular expressions book or my courses. Um, and I mean, people click on those links. Uh, now I need to improve the landing pages cause then I need to increase conversions, but I know that some people each week are clicking on the links. It's not an overwhelming number, but some at least, um, but I haven't, you know, made it. I haven't changed it so it would push people up the ladder. I guess at this point that might not be necessary. I think you're you're doing a good job of convincing me that there's no clear, there's no overwhelmingly clear ladder here. That until I have more products to fill that out, it might not really be necessary. Yeah, or I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a hundred percent convinced that this is what you must do. Like refactor your product ladder so it's about increasing expertise but i gotta say in our conversation thus far i haven't i haven't seen anything from my perspective it looks like a better way to structure it you know um and i i think a lot of folks end up where you are and where i am where the product ladder doesn't make perfect sense and and you have to maybe do some restructuring somewhere along the way because product creation is not easy and we all kind of start where it makes sense for us. Maybe that's writing a book or creating some kind of coaching program that breaks the connection between time and money or something like that. And it, it's not like we design the whole thing perfectly on a, some kind of blueprint and then spend a year building six different products and, and then we launch and it all works the way it's supposed to. <laughs> like it's kind of messy. We, we sort of back our way into it. But I just wonder if maybe, I don't know, that's the one thing I do feel pretty strongly about Ruben is like, I think you got to figure out like what is the easy, simple, dumb, you know, fifth grader could understand this differentiation between different products in, in the, in the ladder. Like who, what, what is each product meant to solve and who is it meant to solve it for? I think that's another way to do it is just treat it like there is no ladder. It's, it's a catalog of very useful products that are sort of problem focused products. Oh, I realized I, I, I meant, I wanted to for probably less for you and more for the other listeners talk about Alan Weiss's product ladder because he's doing this sort of two axis uh, differentiation. So Alan Weiss is a consultant who has kind of over time gradually moved into being a consultant who doesn't consult anymore, but teaches other people how to do consulting. And so you'll see he's got, I don't know. I mean, he's always uh, reminding <laughs> me bragging might be a better word, but always reminding how many titles he has translated into different languages but, you know, he's got numerous books on different topics related to consulting. And they all have this branded theme, Million Dollar Something. Million Dollar Consulting is one book. Million Dollar Proposals is another. Million Dollar Referrals is another. Uh, I think the Million Dollar Consulting Blueprint is yet another. So lots and lots of books where 
it's at, I mean, they're priced like you would expect business books to be priced, you know, between like 25 and $50 is kind of the general price range for longer business books that are published through a conventional uh, publisher. And they all are, I think for the most part, published through traditional publishers. So that's one axis of differentiation is what's the specific topic you're wanting help with? Like with Reuven, you mentioned having products that are problem focused or, you know, solution focused or whatever. After buying and consuming this thing, you will be able to do the following. You will be able to do some level of, uh, what is it? Um, you know, scientific data analysis using Python. What's, what's the right term there? Well, I mean, I think just like you'll be able to use it to solve problems in, at work you okay. know, and solve programming problems. Right. Or here's um, this other one. But, you'll be able to, you know, do some, some other specific thing. So in it, just back to Alan Weiss's world, sorry to uh, cut you off there, but I wanted to finish the example. So he's got these, you know, these books at, at what would be the, that's the least amount of money you can spend with this dude is you buy a book and, and, and there's all these different topics. So he's got another layer up from that, which are like $99 one hour, uh, basically paid webinars. And it's the same structure, but at a higher price point. And so instead of reading a book on proposals, let's say he might have a webinar on proposals. Again, you're paying for it. It's not free, like a lot of webinars. And it's more like a, a sort of like a live training. And you can ask questions. I have no idea. I have no idea he even did, did this. Oh, my gosh. But clearly, I'm sure a lot of people do, and he's making a lot of money from it. Well, once, once you pull one thread on, on the Alan Weiss's ecosystem of products and services, you're, it starts unraveling. You're like, oh, my gosh, this guy has, I don't know, maybe over 100 distinct things that you can buy. Now, there, some of them are you know, completely hands-off for him. Some of them are very high-touch for him. You know, you can buy one-on-one -on -one coaching with him at, I don't know, three, five thousand dollars a month. You can buy uh, what he calls the Bentley card, which is this, uh, I think, twenty thousand dollar purchase that gives you access to everything he's ever created. So he's he's not only got this ladder of products; he's bundling things in certain ways. Anyway, Reuven, you'll uh, you'll be astonished once you kind of look under the 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 hood of what he's got going on. But my point is, he's it almost looks, I think, with him sort of like a pyramid is kind of what his product ladder looks like. So at the base, there's low price books, dozens of topics. And then the next layer up, there's higher price, still many topics. But then as you get higher and higher up, you're paying more and more money because you're just getting more access to him. But at the highest level, you're just paying for one thing, which is a lot of access to that dude. And he'll just help you with whatever you want, whatever you need help with. So that's an interesting product ladder for people to look at. Very intimidating because if you're a freelancer and you're like, well, I would like a product, I would like to make money while I sleep. So I'm not totally dependent on my time. Don't at all get the impression, <laughs> get the impression that you have to go from that point to having 50 products in a ladder all at once. Nobody does that overnight. That's like a 30 year project to get there. But um, anyway. Right, like he's clearly been growing these books and everything else for many, many years, but that that's, that's a, a great goal to have, right? Like I would love to have a library of say 30 video courses and five books. And so anyone, you know, anyone who's anyone in the Python world is going to want to say, well, I'll try this and I'll try this. And I'll try this. Like that would be a great position to be in. And it's not impossible to imagine that. I just need to then straight. I think in many ways, I mean, some of my big takeaways from this conversation are right, number one, I need to really more sharply define who each of these products is meant for, what they're going to be able to accomplish, both for the selling of it and so that I can see who I'm supposed to be selling, like who, who I'm supposed to be selling to, and I can even have a better um, a landing page that way and make it much clearer. Um, and I can pitch to the right people. Number two, that'll then help me to see what the holes are and where, like, where, who am I missing and who would benefit most. And in some ways, that will actually help me then with part three, which is these video courses, who should I then be servicing first? Right? Not necessarily what's the most popular, but what will fit into these products best. Yeah, 
yeah. I mean, I guess the wild card there is maybe you you sort of approach it like uh, I, this is sort of contradicting everything I've said thus far. <laughs> but you sort of like if you went to O'Reilly Publishing and you looked at their catalog of titles and you said, OK, I want to see everything on Python. I don't know. They're probably going to have what a dozen or three dozen or, you know, so I'm going to guess between 20 and 50 titles on Python. And I'm not quite sure how they would do that. I guess that could be pretty informative because you could sort of say, okay, I want to be just the, I want to be like O'Reilly, but these are all self-published titles that Reuven Lerner has created for people who are trying to learn Python. And so some of them are going to be data science with Python and some of them are going to be, um, you know, uh, system administration with Python, they're going to be sort of these different specific use cases and they'll be by different authors and they may have some kind of difficulty level, but there's not really an idea of a, of a ladder baked into the, how that a publishing company would do that. It's just, it, I think with a publishing company, it's probably more, more kind of solution focused like web apps with Python or Python plus whatever you do to make a Python app run on a mobile phone. You know, like that's how they're going to structure the content. That's a whole different model. That's not a ladder at all, I don't think. It's just more of a catalog of useful stuff. No reason you couldn't do that either. <laughs> right. Right. And and I guess in many, well, I guess sort of Alan Weiss seems to have done them both, right, where he has a whole lot of different products, but it's clear that you sort of, he wants you to move from, you know, just buying his books to getting the webinars and then getting his, yep. you know, personal attention. Yep. Um, yep. It seems like sort of the best of both worlds. Well, but that just takes a lot of time. It really, it's, I mean, I really mean it when I say it's like a 20 or 30 year project to really get there. And I think it just at first you might, I would certainly focus on the shortfall between where I am now and where I want to be. And that could be discouraging. And so I'm not necessarily recommending that, but just for sake of completion, that's another model that's a, it's not even really the, I mean, I guess it is, you know, with O'Reilly, I like using them as an example because I think they're a really wonderful company. So you can buy a book and you can then, a lot of times they'll have uh, like live webinar style trainings from their authors. And I think they charge for that. So it, oh, it is kind of like the Alan Weiss model. Uh, so there's that, that's maybe the next level up, maybe you pay 150 bucks for a, you know, to be on a webinar with one of their authors who gives a training and you can do Q and A and then they have conferences, you know, they have one called strata, which I think is for, um, UX or data products or something like that. So that's more money. That's an event. It's just not, there's not just one person at the focal point of that pyramid of products. It's more, um, they're just, you know, not taking advantage is the wrong word, but they're, uh, they're making use of these kind of star power of their authors to make that work. Right. Anyway, it's a similar, now that I think about it, it's not just a catalog of books. There's more to it than that. And you can buy a subscription. Uh, I think in fact, now they, that's the only way with O'Reilly you can get their books. I think is you have to buy a subscription and you get all their books. Right, so you can get a subscription. I think you can buy, no, no, you can buy their books online, just not through them directly. They got out of that. I see. And now, okay. uh, if you want to get like a Kindle version of their book, that's fine. Just get it from Amazon, not from them. Got it. Okay. Got it. Got it. So they're just doing the subscription or a la carte, you go someplace else. Right. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm just kind of muddying the water with detail here, but hopefully it just... No, no, this gives the folks at home some good. stuff to think about in terms of there's more than one way to approach this, this sucker. Absolutely. No, this is a very good food for thought. And given that I'm already like about to start tinkering with some of my different products, um, you know, between the courses and weekly Python exercise and improving them in various ways, this, this will definitely help me to sharpen that out. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. I think we should probably head into picks. No, yeah, I think we should too. This episode is sponsored by Linode. Linode is offering listeners of this podcast a $20 credit, which is good for four free months at their lowest plan. Their plans start at one gigabyte of RAM for $5 a month. You can get your servers in any of their 10 data centers 
and their high memory plans start at 16 gigabytes. Get a server running in under a minute. They do hourly billing with a monthly cap on all plans and add-on services like backups, node balancers, long view, etc. VMs for full control, running Docker containers, encrypted disks, VPNs, etc. You can run a private Git server. They provide native SSD storage, 200 gigabit network, and Intel E5 processors. They have 24-7 friendly support, even on holidays, and a seven-day money-back guaranteed. So go check them out at lino.com slash freelancer show. Okay. You got anything this week, Philip? I got one pick. So occasional panelists on the show, Curtis McHale recommended a book to me that I took a long, took me a long time to get through, not because of the size of it, just because I would listen to a few chapters on Audible here and there and just thought it was fan freaking tastic. <laughs> so uh, here's the book, and I hope this makes people laugh. Be careful, I, I suppose, when you search for the title for this book. It's called Getting Naked is the first part. And then the subtitle is A Business Fable about shedding the, the three fears that sabotage client loyalty. It's by this guy, Patrick Lencioni, who I know nothing about really, but I listened to the audiobook uh, version of this book and it was, I just thought fantastic. It's now, I think, in my top five list of titles that I might recommend to someone who's interested in moving out of the world of you're kind of a freelance order taker. And into that world of you're providing advice, that's at least part of what you do is providing advice. And the fact that you do that is, is part of your value to clients. I mean, even, you know, the freelance order taker is going to occasionally provide advice and maybe not be listened to because that wasn't why they were brought in. But as you start to shift more and more of the value of what you do to helping your clients make good decisions... I think that the ideas expressed in this book, Getting Naked, are just so valuable. So the book is structured as, a, I mean, it's right there in the subtitle, A Business Fable. So it's structured as a, a sort of um, a fictional story that is meant to to teach you something or make a point. I mean, that's really, I guess, what a fable does is, is tries to make a point. And... Oh my gosh, it, I, I just found the whole thing so interesting and easy to listen to and very uh, engaging and um, ultimately very, I think, educational about the value of being honest and, you know, it, it gives, I think, paints a different picture of how you might do sales, where a lot of us think of sales as persuading or convincing or influencing people to pay money for something. And there's a whole different idea that's presented here, which just is like, well, what if you just got in and started helping people? And that led to a sale rather than trying to sell somebody the fact that you would help them. Anyway, that's my pick for this week. Again, it's a book by this guy, Patrick Lynn Keone called Getting Naked. And I'll, of course, link to it in show notes. Uh, and there we go. That's my pick, Ruben. Wow. Fascinating. So I've got a, a, a simple pick uh, for this week. As I mentioned, I was surveying my list and I haven't really tried that many other tools over the years, but I've been using SurveyMonkey for a while. I know it's not like, you know, the coolest thing that everyone's using now, but I'm very happy with it. I even went so far. So, so I used the free tier for a long time. Um, and I always wondered why would anyone pay for beyond that? And it turns out that if you get more than, I think it's a hundred responses to a survey, they say, hey, wouldn't you like to see those other responses? You have to pay to do that. So a few months ago, I, I did that because I actually had a survey I did to my list that um, had more than 100 responses. And I'm not using any of the fancy, fancy tools that they have, but I find it very easy to work with, to add uh, things with. And so um, I, I'm a, a happy Survey Monkey client, customer for now. Um, so if you're any, any, anyone's interested in doing simple surveys, the free tier is probably just fine unless you start getting into very large numbers of people responding, which I was very happy to have, but it doesn't happen that often. Oh, interesting. Does, does, I remember the UI being kind of basic. Has that changed at all? Um, it's a little nicer now. I definitely see that it has a little pizzazz. Like when I was just sort of testing my latest survey, it looked a lot like, I'm trying to remember, what is everyone using now? A lot of people using Typeform. Right. And definitely had 
a type form kind of look where it's that almost scrolly thing where the top and the bottom of the, the window are grayed out and only in the middle it's black so you can see it more easily. Yeah. So I think they've been stealing some of the UI from that. Okay. Um, That's good to hear. So, yeah, I mean, they're like, uh, they're, there's someone there who's thinking, thinking about how to make it look a little more modern, that's for sure. Cool. All right. Well, Phil, thank you once again for a great, useful conversation. Yeah, this was super um, fun. Excellent. Thanks to all of you for listening out there, and we'll be back next week on The Freelancer Show. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.